Welcome to the Equip Podcast. Here you'll find conversations from people of all different walks of life, sharing their experiences, the things the Lord has taught them, and things to equip you. Equip is based on Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, that talks about equipping God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That is our goal here, to build you up and equip you through seasons of ups and downs in life. I'm excited about what the Lord has put on my heart. Um, It's cool to look back and see through all of the messages how God has been just building one upon the other. And so, um, like Taylor said, me and my family, we uh, lived in Ohio for six years. My husband served as a pastor of worship and discipleship there, and it was there that the Lord really began to put a burden on my heart for women and women's ministry. it, it was a very transformative time in my life and in my family's life, um, and it's a, it's a place that we still look back on very fondly, but the Lord brought us home, and so we were, we, me and my husband and I, we've been married for 10 plus years, and for all of those years, we lived at least eight hours away from our family, so it's been sweet. We moved back in June of this past year, and so we've got to be close to family, and we've got to uh, know what it's like to have grandparents close, and who can watch our children, and it's great, and they're here today, my sweet little girls. I have two little girls, Clara and Lila, and they are seven and nine, um, and they get to come watch their mom today. It just means so much. Um, all that to say, I want us to just take a couple minutes. I know that there's been a lot that has been spoken over these last few sessions, Um, I know what it's like to be at a conference. I've been to so many, not speaking, just sitting out there just like you. And I know that last session, you're just kind of overflowing. You have so much the Lord is speaking to you, and we just need to take a minute just to pause. And I want you to ask, we're going to take like one minute just to pray where we are and ask the Lord to cement in your heart what he has been speaking to you over these past few sessions, that God would bring to mind what it is that he wants you to take away from our time together. It would be a tragedy if you left here today and you said the worship was so good, the speakers were so good, but what did you take away? What did God do in your heart? And so that is what I want you to just take a moment and ask the Lord, please, Lord, help me leave here with a transforming burden on my heart, something that you are calling me to do, and let me be faithful to obey you in that. And then if you would also just pray for me, take a moment to pray that God would speak through me and help me and use me. So right where you're at, if you would just go ahead and do that, just bow your head and personally in your own time, quiet your heart before the Lord. So, Lord, we, um, we come to you today, and we, we thank you that you use us. We thank you, God, that you have given us your Son and your Holy Spirit to enable us to live holy lives. Thank you that you are sovereign and that, Lord, you have created needs in all of our lives. You have brought us here needy for you, and I'm so thankful I pray, God, that as we leave here today, that our hearts would burn within us, just like the disciples did when they talked with you on the road to Emmaus, that, Lord, they would, we would all leave here saying, did our hearts not burn within us because we have been with Jesus? And that is our prayer, Lord. Would you be faithful to come and, and settle in our hearts what needs to be settled there? settled there. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to listen to your word. I pray that your word would be preeminent in this place today. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move. And I pray that you would not let the enemy steal your word today. Let it fall on good soil. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I have one goal today. It's a very big goal, but I just want to proclaim to you Jesus. And I'm so excited. Um, This is a message that God has been writing on my heart for many years, Um, and one I haven't really got to speak on yet. 
I know um, in this size of a room, like there are many stories that you have brought in here. Some of you are in a season of waiting on God. Some of you are in a season of receiving. Some of, some of you are suffering by the hands of others. Some are suffering because of your own choices. Some of you are running from the Lord and some of you are just quietly rebelling and nobody knows about it. Some of you are being called right now to do something that scares you and requires much faith. Some of you are learning how to enjoy the quietness of life and the gifts that God has given you. And some of you are experiencing all of those things because we are women and our emotional capacity confounds the wise. I don't know about you, it does me. Whether you are stuck in sin or living in victory or somewhere in between, we all need this word today. We need to be reminded of who it is that we proclaim as women, as Christians. We need to be reminded what we proclaim We need to be reminded what threatens the message that we proclaim and how not to lose heart in proclaiming it. That's a lot of proclaiming, but it's good. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. That's where we're going to be planted today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. So this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, which if you know anything about the church in Corinth... um, They had had a lot of issues. And so we see Paul comes back in 2 Corinthians and he's trying to comfort them. He's trying to help them after he has addressed so many issues in 1 Corinthians. And he starts getting into the ministry that they have been given. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And this is our key verse. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So if you have your outline, that first point is your ministry— as a Christian, is to proclaim Jesus Christ. That is your ministry, to proclaim Jesus Christ. We are surrounded by a world that calls us foolish, that calls us silly, that calls us um, irrelevant, whose eyes have never seen the beauty and the glory of Jesus. And so Paul's thought process leads him to say, listen, we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ. This is how we serve our neighbors and our friends, our our children and our grandchildren. All those who God has put into our lives, we proclaim Jesus. Look at uh, verse four, I mean, chapter four, verse one. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. So this is a word for the weary today. This is a word for those who are ready to throw in the towel and give up, those who are tempted to slow down in what God has called you to. And so we have to ask, he says, having this ministry. So what is this ministry? Simply put, it is the new covenant. It is the new covenant that came with the coming of Jesus Christ. If you'll take a look in chapter um, 3, Paul compares the old covenant, the way of God's people in the Old Testament, to the way of God's people under the new covenant. And he's talking about the letter of the law, so the Ten Commandments. And he compares this to the Holy Spirit who gives life. So look in chapter 3 at verse 9. It says, for if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. If there was glory in what brought you condemnation, 
how much more glory comes with the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of righteousness. It is far exceeding. We cannot even fathom how much more glorious this ministry is that we are now under, that we are living in as New Testament Christians. So Paul is saying, if the law which laid a heavy burden on God's people, one that they could never truly bear. If that caused Moses' face to shine so brightly that he had to put a veil over his face, then how much greater and how much brighter, how much stronger must the ministry be that we have been given under Christ? He's saying, do not lose heart, Christian. Do not lose heart. Do not slow down. Do not give in to your fleshly desires. The veil has been lifted. The very Spirit of God has come down to dwell with us and inside of us. And Christ Jesus has broken that heavy yoke, that heavy yoke that we bore, the demands of the law, and our inability to obey fully. Mary Margaret talked about like what we're called to, our obedience. What's beautiful about the gospel is that Jesus came and his perfect life lived. Do you know that means everything? for you. He did not just, we we like to focus on his death, but if he would not have come and fulfilled righteousness for you, he would not have died a substitutionary death for you. He had to fulfill the law. Every jot and tittle was fulfilled in Jesus. And so under that, he broke the yoke from us and he stood in our place in his obedience. And that is good news. And that leads us to another part of this ministry. And this is our second point. We have been given a ministry that shouts freedom for us. We have been given a ministry that shouts freedom for us. We're still going to be actually in chapter 3, verse 17. Um, This is a very familiar verse. It says, now, the Lord is the Spirit, And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I was studying this verse, and I have quoted that verse many times. Funny enough, one of my first ever teachings was on that passage. It was at a ladies' tea in Ohio. I was so nervous, and I did not know what I was doing. I think I talked for an hour and a half. Like, it was so long. It was ridiculous. And and if you know that, that's not surprising. If you know me, that's not surprising. Um, but as I was studying this verse, um, after quoting it so many times, it wasn't until I was preparing for this message that the Lord let me really see the significance of this verse for my life. Um, I've always had a picture of where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When I would say that, I would think like of a, a physical place, like this building, for instance. Um, it, it reminded me of like a Spirit coming and filling a place. So I would pray, you know, come fill this place, Lord. And that's not wrong to pray, but that's really not what what Paul is talking about here. God really deepened the thought for me because Paul says where the Spirit of the Lord is, present tense, there is freedom. So where is the Spirit? Where is the Holy Spirit? Where does He dwell in you, in His children? That is where He is. So God is telling us the Spirit, my Holy Spirit dwells in you, and where He is is where freedom is. Where he is dwelling, that is where freedom is. That is why you are constantly being freed from something. Like, however old you are, you're never going to be um, done. Until you you go to heaven, you will never be done. You are always being freed from something. You are always being, uh, sin is always being revealed to you. And the Holy Spirit is always trying to drive it out. And so... If you have the Holy Spirit, he is a spirit of freedom. We cannot stay in the bondage of sin if we know him. We cannot remain stuck. We cannot be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and be in total bondage at the same time. So I say total because there are times when we are in bondage as believers. I think we would all lie if we said that there have not been times in our lives where sin has caught us, reminds me of Hebrews 12, um, it entangled us. 
But this is saying, this is not normal. This should not be normal of your life. This should not be normal of my life. This is abnormal. And and 1 John 1, 6 is very clear. It says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. There is, this is not a place that we want to settle in and say, it's okay. This is not a place where we say, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. This is a place that we are unwanted. Sin has crept into our lives and it has deceived us into thinking that we will never be free and never be delivered. And like, I just want you to know I have been there. I have been there so many times. And if that is you today, like my heart goes out to you. And I want you to hear that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of freedom and he's not done with you. He is not done with you yet. I don't care how old you are. I, when I was praying for y'all, I, I thought of the older ladies. I don't know why the Lord kept bringing you on my, my mind because I think this, our generation, we need you. We need you to step up and we need you to pour out and we need to know more of of the experiences that you have had with walking with Jesus, those moments where God has burned um, a message in your heart. And I thought of those of you in here who might just feel like, I'm done. Like, I'm just gonna retire and quit. And it's like, no, God will keep using you until the day you die. And I pray that is your prayer tonight or to whatever it is this afternoon. Um, I pray that that is your desire. And if it's not, let God begin to birth that in you. So what do you do, though, when you are that person and you're stuck in sin? Or maybe you just feel unusable. Maybe you're like, I can't speak. Um, I don't know how to study my Bible well. I have all these weak areas. I'm just not like the best looking Christian. I just... I don't have it all together. So what do you do when you feel you have nothing good to bring to the table? Maybe you're just tired. Uh, Maybe you've been paralyzed by the words of others. Maybe you are uh, literally physically beset with physical weakness. Whatever it is, I want you to see, and this is our third point, your message and your identity is not your performance. Your message and your identity is not your performance. Here's where we will spend the majority of the rest of our time. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Paul says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants. So the word proclaim in the Greek literally means herald or preach or announce. So what are we announcing to the world? What are we proclaiming? Paul is saying that it's not a message about us. It's not your message. Yes, you have a testimony, but if the gospel is not in that testimony, it's not a testimony. We minister in the places that God has put us as heralds of another, ambassadors who are representing another person. And this is really good news for us because he's saying we do not go around displaying ourselves, saying hope in our good works, hope in our godliness, hope in our performances that week. He's saying, no, we are not announcing ourselves to the world. Our role is clear. Our role is clear. We are servants of the Lord and the ones that he sends us to. But we are not the Lord and we are not the hope for humanity. That pressure needs to be lifted off of us so that we can run the race that he's called us to. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 4 through 6 says this. Listen to this. It's so good. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent. He has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter, talking about the law, kills, but the spirit gives life. 
So the confidence, ladies, of our lives are to spring from the Lord and not ourselves. What we bring to the table is not our lives, but it is Christ and Him crucified. I told my grandfather, um, he could not be here, obviously, because this is the ladies' conference. Um, And he would not have come anyways, because he sits a lot right now. Um, But I told him, he said, well, what are you going to speak about? And I said, well, I said, proclaiming Jesus Christ. And he said, good. It's not talked about enough. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm so glad that I, I have your approval on that. Um, but what we bring to the table is not our lives. It is Christ and Him crucified. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about this. I want y'all to lean in. There's a lot of scriptures that I'm about to read, but, but listen to how powerful this is. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 through 2, Paul says this, And I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the testimony of our lives, Jesus Christ and him crucified. But why? What is it about Jesus and his crucifixion that made Paul say that he himself knew nothing? Like he, did, he had a lot he knew, okay? He was, a, he was a pharisaical Jew. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was talking about. But he chose to focus on Paul, I mean, on Jesus and his crucifixion and the cross. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 24. He says, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the Jews, the cross was a symbol of a life that had utterly failed. A sign of someone cursed, the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And for the Greeks, the cross held no wisdom. There was no insight there. There was no Enneagram number or whatever. No power. It was a foolish and simplistic message. But Paul understood the power of God was not in worldly wisdom or in a sign. Jesus had much to say about seeking a sign. And I know that we're kind of in a different culture and it's kind of like, well, how how do we seek for signs? We do. We do in different ways. It reminds me of the story of Gideon, how he just tested the Lord over and over. Just give me one more sign. Confirm to me one more time before I do this thing for you. Just keep confirming it. Can keep, keep showing it. Well, this is saying, no, I, Jesus was your sign. Jesus was your sign. You don't need another one. And, and so Jesus actually says, when you seek a sign, it's adultery. Jesus knew that our hearts are more prone to love signs than who the signs point to. In Matthew 12, 38 through 40, this is a story in Jesus. uh, He says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what did he point to? He kept pointing people to his crucifixion because it was there alone where true power, true wisdom, true love, acceptance, hope, justification, salvation was displayed. And now Paul is saying, this is your message. This is your message. This is still what we are pointing people to. We will never get over the gospel. This is never going to be an old, old story. This is a story that we are constantly pointing people to, and it's not coming from us. It has nothing to do with your sufficiency, how able you are, how competent you are as a woman. All the power is in the message of the cross. So much so that Paul denied his fleshly impulse to impress people. Like I said, he had a really impressive resume. And he said, no, I'm willing to look foolish and simplistic so that men and women would walk away not impressed by me, but eternally changed. So this is a call for us to push past our obsession with performance. 
to push past our obsession with perfectionism and as if that is where the power is and remember how God uses what is weak. And this is one of our last points. Weakness is not a threat. Weakness is a catalyst for empowering grace. I'll say that again. Weakness is not a threat. Weakness is a catalyst for empowering grace. So by catalyst, if you don't know what that word means, it just basically means the vehicle that God uses to show his grace. So Paul knew of weakness. Many of you are familiar with 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12. You might be thinking of it right now, where we find some transparency from from Paul, and apparently he's been plagued. He has some weakness in his life, um, and he's, it literally says that he's being tormented with this. And it, it, we don't know if it's physical or if it's spiritual. I think it's probably both. Um, but Paul is begging the Lord to take this thorn in the flesh, as he calls it, away from him. And what was the Lord's response? He asked him three times, Lord, take this from me. This is getting in the way of what I'm doing. Take this from me. And, and, and uh, it says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. He pleads with the Lord. He wants an answer. He wants deliverance. But Jesus' answer to him was grace. So let's think about that for a second. Let's think about grace for a second. So what comes into your mind when you think about grace? The definition, right? Undeserved favor or the love of God, which is undeserved. But in this context, how is grace enough for Paul? Like, what is it? When we feel so weak and when God has called us to do something and we feel so incompetent, or not enough, how does this grace that the Lord says is enough for Paul remain enough for us today? We can think of those broader definitions like undeserved favor as kind of like an umbrella, as a foundation of grace. But ladies, grace did not come to us just once. It was not just at the moment of our salvation. The grace that is found in Jesus comes to us again and again and again in order to enable us to endure to the end. And this grace that Paul is referring to is a grace that meets us in our weakness and pain and provides divine power, divine power. So, hey, are you experiencing weakness right now? Like whether it's physical, spiritual, whatever, guess what? This grace that we're talking about is meant for those very moments. And until you realize that you are in constant need of the Holy Spirit's power, then you will experience very little of what Paul is talking about. You will miss out on the sufficient grace of God and the joy that it brings to your life. Like when you are weak and you say, God, use me. Like enable me to do the thing you're calling to me, calling me to do. And then you experience him be faithful. That is a joy like none other. No, no alcohol, no, no experience can replace that kind of joy. So God, well, this does remind me, um, John Piper said one time, grace is not just pardon, but it is power. So grace did not just come and pardon you from your sin. It empowers us to walk as Christ has called us. So God did not save you and then leave you to yourself. So you may be saying, no, I don't do that. That's not me. I want to ask you some diagnostic questions. Okay, I want you to diagnose yourself today. I wanna see if, if you're trying to perfect yourself by the flesh. So I came across this article and it blew me away. I was studying and I began to weep. I called my husband afterwards. I had to walk away from the message and I thought, that is me. Like, this is me. This is how I operate. So this was from an article that I came across written by David Guzik. Um, And these are just some diagnostic questions to, to see, do you truly live by grace? Number one, Do you experience inconsistent victory over sin? 
Do you experience inconsistent victory over sin? Listen to this quote, it's kind of lengthy. There is a dynamic of struggle with sin that some people feel much worse than others. And this whole dynamic of a very inconsistent victory of sin often gets traced back to law instead of grace. Because under law, our eyes are on ourselves. You see, if I believe that God's opinion of me depends on my own actions, then I have to analyze every thought, every word, every deed, so that I can predict how God's going to treat me. This kind of self-focused introspection takes away from my ability to rest in and to rely on the strength of the Lord. And I need that strength if I'm going to walk in any kind of victory over sin. You see, the child of God who lives by the law does experience victory. Listen to this. It can be so, but when they do, it can be even more dangerous because that victory will tend to feed their pride. They begin to think that they have conquered the monster of sin and made themselves pleasing to God instead of seeing that Christ in us conquers sin and makes us pleasing to God. You see, if that were to happen, then Satan has caught his greatest prize, a saint who is sincere but acts in a self-righteous manner. Under law, our eyes are on ourselves and not on Jesus. And this makes victory very difficult to grasp, but it's dangerous if we ever do grasp it under the principle of the law. So is that you? Is that how you function? Like, is that how you think about God? Number two, does fear often paralyze you in what God has called you to do? This stems from perfectionism. And I really struggle with this. Like I want everything I say to be perfect. Like I just, I want it to be seamless and I struggle with this and it paralyzes me. It does, it has paralyzed me for most of my life. But if you were to realize that who you proclaim is not yourself, you would be freed from this kind of fear that weighs every action, every thought, every task as if God's approval hangs in the balance. This is just another form of living by the flesh living as if you were proclaiming yourself and your performance more than proclaiming the perfect work of Jesus. And then this last thing, do you often feel as if you are on probation from God? Someone who lives as if God is out to get them or is constantly under the microscope of his judgment tends to do very little for the Lord because you are always scared, you're always timid, you're never willing to be courageous and rise up like Debbie talked about. Weakness is a threat to you because you constantly feel as if you're walking on eggshells instead of under the loving care of your father. There is no testing period and there's no hidden agenda from the Lord. You were saved by the blood of the lamb and you will be kept by him. That's really good news. And your salvation is secure. So run, run as if he really loves you and you're not on probation. All of that was paid for on the cross because recognize that weakness reveals who you are trusting in, especially when it calls, when it, when it comes to rising up to do what God has called you to do. There was a particular season in my Christian life where I had nothing good to look at within myself. Um, I could see very little movement of the Spirit of God and fruit appeared minimal. Um, seem, sin seemed to have won in my life and I made a very devastating decision that resulted in me uh, being in a presence of a counselor for many months. And I'm sure your wheels are turning because you're a lady and you're like, what you do, what you do? But I'm not gonna tell you what it was. Maybe the Lord will allow me to share that one day, but know that it was bad and it was costly. And it was during, um, it was, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um, it was during the season of my life ever after I had repented to the Lord and to all those who were affected um, that I was so stuck. I was so stuck. I could not get past my sin. And I sat in front of my counselors and they looked at me and they said, Haley, like what you're doing right now, it's no, you're no longer repenting. You're paying penance. You're not repenting. You are trying to pay for your sin. 
And that's what I was doing. I remember calling my mom because yes, I still call my mom all the time. And I said, mom, I tell women all the time, all the time to trust in Jesus, look to Jesus, believe the gospel. And I'm having a really hard time doing that for myself right now. And it was in that place at this particular verse that we're talking about, it gave, it gave flight to me. It helped me get up and get my eyes off of myself. It brought life to me because I remembered the wonderful name of Jesus that is above all of my sin and all of my shame. And that empowers me to run with endurance the race that has been set before me. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of my faith, who is the forerunner who has gone before me. So let me ask you, when the worst about you is true, ladies, like when you come to realize who you really are and the worst about you is true, listen, I know we live in the South and after being away for six years and coming back, we like to cover up a lot of things. And I can guarantee you there are women in here who are walking in serious sin. And I have been praying for you because this is what the enemy wants you to do. He is trying to push that out of your mind so hard right now, but do not let him do that. Know that coming to Jesus means freedom for you. It does not mean shame. Don't listen to that lie. So when the gospel is spoken, is it what satisfies your soul? Or do you want to be righteous on your own merit? Like, does the gospel bring relief to you? Is the righteousness of Jesus enough for you? The true test is when what is truly revealed about you and how terrible you truly are and your ability to walk in sin's dark pathway, when that's revealed, are you able to move on and keep going? Are you able to push past and stand tall because the Lord is your salvation and not you? So when we encounter the grace of Jesus, it will always direct our hearts back to faith in His work. I want you to write this down. True grace conforms us as we behold the glory of God. True grace conforms us as we behold the glory of God. False grace leaves us where we are, just with better feelings. False grace leaves us where we are, just with better feelings. So which grace are you walking in? Which message are you proclaiming with your life? Which brings me to my last point. You cannot proclaim Jesus in this way if he does not know you. If he does not know you. I chose those words very carefully carefully because we see many times in scripture of the emphasis being on whether God knows you, not on whether you know him. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I have never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. 1 Corinthians 8, 3, But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. John 10, 27 through 28, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Nahum 1, 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. 2 Timothy 2, 9, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who are his. Last one, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. So if you don't know Jesus, this is your time. This is your time to repent and turn from your sins. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you on the cross and run to him in freedom and surrender, willing to do whatever he calls you to do, knowing that coming to him is coming to life, but also coming to him is bearing a cross. Coming to him is walking a narrow path that not many want to walk, but knowing that his grace is enough to enable you to do that every single thing that he calls you to do. And if you're, you are a believer, I want you to leave. I know this is a heavy message. I totally get that. I see your faces. It's very serious. 
But I want you to, to leave feeling like, yes, I feel incompetent. I feel weak. And I want you to know that's a really good place. That's a really good place because God has created a need in your life and He is going to meet that need. That is the place where you're going to experience more of Jesus and His power so that you can go tell the world, hey, I know Jesus, He knows me, and let me show you and tell you what He does for weak people. Because that is our testimony, proclaiming the name of Jesus. So I'm gonna pray for us. If that is you today, that you're like, I I do not know if I am known by him. There are gonna be some ladies in the white Cultivate t-shirt. I want you to run to them and find them and tell them. It would, it would be horrible if you left here without dealing with that. Please do not. Do not be ashamed. No one's going to look weird at you. Please call out. This is the most important decision of your life. Lunch can wait. Whatever your plans are today can wait. You go and you run and you seek Jesus. And then if you are the one who is stuck in sin or just feeling weak, or just feeling like I have so much in my heart, I just need to pray. Please find those ladies. They would love to pray for you. Um, And I will be here as well if you would like me to pray with you. It's been an honor to be here with you today. Let's pray. Jesus, your name is the name that is above every name. There is no name that is greater. There is no weakness that is attached to your name. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that we get to leave here um, just in awe of who you are, not who we are, but of who you are. And we have seen, Lord, in your word over these last couple days, just that what you call us to do, you have already provided in Jesus. And so I pray that we would just take a good, hard look at you and that we would leave here more transformed, beholding your glory and being transformed into one degree of glory to the next. Jesus, have your way. We just pray that we would not get in the way of what you're trying to do in this place. I pray against the enemy and his schemes right now where he is trying to just come against your work. I pray that you would not let him steal the word. Let him not discourage women, but let them leave here knowing that you love them. He who did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with with him give us all things? Lord, let that word sink deeply into our hearts. Thank you for this ministry and this conference. We pray that you would be glorified, you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Equip Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to be the first to know when a new episode drops. And follow us on social media to stay connected. We're at GABC underscore women. See you next time.